Hi everyone and welcome back in my studio. In a previous video of mine, I talked about this work and mentioned the ideas and the concepts behind it. I also mentioned that I was going to make a plaster reproduction of the work, which you can see here, and offer it as a limited edition to whomever might be interested. But in order to make the reproduction, I first needed to make a silicon mold of the original inscription. And I decided to document the whole process and share it here with you, so that in case you ever needed to make a silicon mold, this video might help you out a bit. So in this video, you will see the whole process of making the mold and casting the reproduction from beginning to end. Mind you, this is not the only way of making a mold, but simply one of many. As a matter of fact, all sculptors have developed their own way of casting, which is based on a few key principles that you will find in this video. So without further ado, let's get to work. First thing that needs to be done is to construct a wooden container. You can think of it as a pool, into which I'll place the inscription facing up and onto which I will pour the silicon to take an imprint. And I'm going to use some plywood panels for concrete formwork to construct the framework of the mold. I started by pre-drilling holes into the plywood base, positioned and secured the walls onto the base with clamps and continued pre-drilling the holes to then fasten everything with screws. I repeated this process for each side until I had a solid base and four walls all strongly fixed. It's very important that all the pieces of the plywood are fitted tightly to one another. Otherwise, the silicon might find a way out through any small gap and you'll end up losing a lot of it. And as you can see, the marble inscription fits very nicely into the framework. The walls need to be tightly fastened also on their side so that no gap is left in between them. So this is the situation now. We have the inscription nicely embedded into a framework of plywood that will contain the silicon when I pour it over the work. And you can see that I've left a couple of centimeters around the marble so that once poured, the silicon will have enough thickness to maintain a relative rigidity. Before preparing the silicon, I'm going to seal the marble with a sealant. Not because the silicon would otherwise not come off, silicon doesn't attach itself to anything other than itself, but mainly to prevent the oils in the silicon to penetrate and stain the stone. And it's important to maintain the whole thing dust free as much as that's possible in a stone carving studio. So I'm keeping the piece covered while preparing the silicon, which needs to be done on a scale, as silicon is a two component product that needs to be mixed in exact proportions. Each brand has its own recommended proportions and this one must be mixed in a ratio of 100 to 5, meaning that 5% of component B needs to be mixed into component A, which you see me pouring now. So I poured 3 kilos and 121 grams of component A, to which I must add 156 grams of component B. Take your time to thoroughly stir the mixture until it has reached a homogeneous consistency. Now, while letting the silicon rest for a couple of minutes before pouring it onto the work, I'm going to seal the outside of the plywood walls for extra safety thus making really sure that the silicon will not pour out of any possible little gaps I might have missed. Here I'm using an oil-based clay, but you can simply use normal clay or tape. And now let's go on with the pouring. Once the silicon touches the work, I advise to keep pouring on the silicon base that you already have so that it gently flows onto the work, pushing away any air that might get trapped under it. I learned that one should aim for a minimum thickness of the silicon of 1 cm. The marble slab was 2 cm thick, so I had to reach a height of 3 cm. So before pouring in the silicon, I marked this measurement on the inside wall of the plywood so that while pouring I would see when the silicon would reach the right height. Also make sure that the whole thing is level. I'm using here clothes spin as wedges and tap them gently under the construction until it's perfectly level. And now the silicon needs to cure for 24 hours and I'm covering the mold to make sure that dust doesn't fall into the silicon. The silicon should have fully solidified and reached a hard but flexible state. So it's time now to disassemble the wooden framework in order to replace this temporary structure with a plaster support for the silicon mold, what we call a counter mold. What you see me doing here is basically repeating the steps that I did for the silicon, assembling the plywood walls to create a pool where to pour in the liquid, 
only instead of the silicon now I will pour the plaster. So it's time to prepare and pour the plaster and in a minute I'll go more in detail and tell you about the proper way to prepare it. But first let me explain that I'm pouring the plaster in two stages. The first one consists of an initial pouring of a small quantity of dense plaster into the mold. The purpose of this pouring is again to seal every possible gap left between the wooden panels so that the second more liquid and heavy pouring will not seep through any eventual opening, resulting in the loss of the plaster, not to mention the mess this makes, and the time required to clean everything up. As you can see, I'm also using this thick plaster to seal the corners of the construction all the way up. Okay, let's take a moment to discuss the preparation of plaster. First, I need to confess that already as of step one, I'm not giving a good example as skin contact with the plaster should be avoided. The reason being that our skin contains oils and salts that affect the hardening process of plaster. As a matter of fact, salt is an ingredient that is sometimes mixed with water before adding the plaster to speed up the hardening process. But ideally, one should not interfere with this natural process by adding other ingredients. Also, ideally, to avoid the formation of large lumps of plaster, one should pass the plaster powder through a fine mesh strainer before adding it to the water. I will probably dedicate one video about plaster in the future where I discuss all these issues in detail. But for now, let me comment on what we're seeing here. So, when scattering the plaster into the water, it's important to spread it evenly over the whole surface so that the powder deposits uniformly under the water. Always avoid throwing handfuls of plaster at once in the water. This will hamper a uniform bonding of the two elements and result in the formation of thick lumps that will compromise the quality of the plaster. Regarding the correct proportions, normally on the package of the plaster, you'll find the ratio of water and plaster to be mixed. This particular plaster required a ratio of 70 parts of water to 100 parts of plaster. So every liter of water you need to add 1 kilo and 430 grams of plaster. But all sculptors do this by sight. As a general rule, you need to keep adding plaster to the water until it will pile up and starts forming what we call an island on the surface of the water. You'll see in a minute what I'm talking about. It's important not to rush the process. In my experience, I've seen many people stressing out while preparing plaster, but really there's no need for that. Take it easy, stay calm, and let the chemical reaction do the work. And usually this takes longer than you'd think. So you can see here how the plaster is not sinking into the water as quickly as it was doing in the beginning. Some islands of plaster are slowly forming on the surface of the water. And this is where you can start playing with the density of the mixture. Depending on the use you plan to make of the plaster, you can stop now and have a more fluid liquid or add some more to make it thicker. This particular plaster that I'm using here has a tendency to solidify rather quickly. So I'm stopping here and let it rest for a minute before stirring the mixture with a wooden stick. I'm tapping on the sides of the bucket to allow for the air bubbles trapped into the liquid to rise to the surface. When you got a texture that resembles that of thick milk or of a drinking yogurt, then the mixture is ready for casting. Since I'm just using this plaster to create a counter mold for the silicon mold, I don't need to be careful with details. So simply pouring the mixture into the wood form is enough. And now to get rid of all the air trapped within the thick liquid, one must tap, blow and rock the mold a bit. The vibrations will help the air bubbles reach the surface and eventually pop. So here we have the form filled with plaster and to make sure that it consolidates firmly, I usually let it dry overnight. It is safe to disassemble the wood without damaging the plaster. I like to go over the corners of the counter mold with a scraper and put a 45 degree chamfer on the edges. This will strengthen the corners and make them less likely to chip off when handling the form. And this is how the counter mold looks from the inside. I was not going to peel off the silicon mold from the inscription yet, as I first needed to create some slots into the counter mold to hold the silicon in place. You'll see what I mean in a minute. I drew the diagonals of the mold onto which I then drilled the holes that will function as slots. First with a small drill and then enlarging the hole with a 4cm wide drill. 
By the way, to be completely dry, cast plaster needs at least a couple of weeks. I drilled these holes only one day after casting, and I thought it would be interesting to show you how wet and not entirely solid the plaster was at the moment on the inside of the block. It was basically still a thick paste. After a quick sanding of the top surface and cleaning the edges of the holes on the inside, it was now time to fit the silicone mold inside the counter mold again and fill the holes with some new silicon. Silicon doesn't stick to anything besides silicon itself. So filling these holes with new silicon under which the previous silicon mold is placed will create a cylindrical protrusion that perfectly fits the holes in the plaster. Thus making sure that the two parts fit seamlessly and that the silicon mold keeps its shape over time. After having let the silicon dry out for 24 hours, it was time to remove the plaster counter mold and now you can clearly see the four cylinders that will function as slots to keep everything in place. And now, finally, the time came to free the original stone inscription from under the silicon mold. And you can see how a perfect negative copy of the inscription was formed in the silicon. So here is the original inscription that I safely put aside to dry as it was still a bit wet from the whole operation. Now it was time to fill the silicon mold with plaster and cast the first copy of the inscription. You can see how the silicon mold clicks into the counter mold due to the cylinder slots. Back to the working table and pouring in the plaster. I don't need to explain this part again. But you can see how quickly this type of plaster hardens as it gets progressively thicker as I keep filling the mold. I usually gently tap the surface of the plaster with my fingers to spread it evenly and make it level. And then again some more tapping, rolling and tapping to remove the air bubbles. And now, after having let the plaster cure overnight, it's finally time to remove the mold and take out the final cast of the inscription. You can see that the cylinder slots are also helpful to push the silicon mold out of its plaster counter mold. This is always the most exciting part of the whole process. It's a pure joy to roll the silicon mold away and discover the cast underneath it. And I must say that it came out quite nicely. The plaster is still very wet and therefore has this grey yellowish tint. But in a few weeks, after it dries out, it will be completely white. There are a few air bubbles unfortunately, but that's not a big deal as this was a first test and the limited edition that I will be making of this mold will be of a higher quality of plaster than this regular one. But overall, I'm happy with the results so far. So that was it. I hope you enjoyed the video and that you find the information useful. If you have a different way of casting, feel free to share it in the comments here below so that we might all learn from it. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. I'll be more than happy to answer it. And as usual, if you want, like this video, subscribe to the channel. That would be all very helpful. Thanks for watching. My name is Adar and I'll see you next time.